Good morning, everyone. I'm Jim McCracken. I'm the director of child psychiatry here, and it's my pleasure to welcome you um, all, those of you who are here in our intimate um, audience, and those of you online for the 37th annual Gertrude Rogers Greenblatt Memorial Lectureship and uh, Fellowship Award. Uh, just want to say a few words before turning it over to Dr. Bath to introduce both the um, fellow, uh, fellow awardee and our distinguished speaker for today. Uh, this program was uh, begun in 1985 uh, by the family of Gertrude Rogers Greenblatt and uh, UCLA to honor her memory and to uh, contribute to um, the uh, propagation of all of the, the qualities that she stood for. Dr. Greenblatt was a child psychiatrist who spent the majority of her professional career in Boston, uh, graduating as one of two women in her medical school class, moving on to join the faculty at Harvard at the Massachusetts Mental Health Center, where she rose to become the director of child psychiatry training. Uh, we honor her legacy for her commitment to compassionate care, to um, uh, raising the standard of treatment of children and families with severe mental illness, and being a pioneer as a woman in academia and role model. Uh, we also have created uh, uh, the, the Fellowship Award uh, as the uh, given to the second year child psychiatry fellow who is um, elected by faculty for demonstrating uh, those qualities of Dr. Greenblatt, Greenblatt the uh, exemplary care, uh, compassionate care for children and families and uh, clinical excellence. You'll hear, hear more about our awardee in a moment. Um, and with our speaker today, we couldn't have done any better um, than having the distinguished Dr. Tammy Benton, uh, the director of child psychiatry at uh, Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania and incoming uh, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry president. Uh, and you'll hear more about the amazing Dr. Benton in a moment. So now I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Eric Bath, uh, professor and vice chair uh, for the introduction of, Dr., uh, of the fellowship awardee. Thank you, Dr. McCracken. So it is uh, my great pleasure and honor to um, introduce Dr. Karina Espana um, for the Greenblatt Award. Uh, Dr. Espana has done her uh, undergraduate training at Portland State University, her residency uh, training at Oregon Health and Science University, and she is currently doing her child fellowship here at UCLA, where she's one of our incredible chief fellows. She's also completed the Community Global Child Psychiatry Area of Distinction. She's also an APA SAMHSA Minority Fellow. Um, she plans to complete a forensics fellowship at OHSU next year. Um, she is, you know, she's most deserving of this award. She is fiery, all heart, and a true Good Trouble champion. I have had the uh, honor of being able to mentor her and I'm so grateful to have her joining the ranks of the very few child forensic psychiatrists. Um, she has expanded my thinking and helping me think about uh, trauma narratives and its potential and capacity for youth and juvenile justice populations. And I'm just truly excited to see uh, what she's going to do with her career. Congratulations. So now I will introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Tammy Benton. Dr. Benton is board certified in pediatric psychiatry, child and adolescent psychiatry, and psychosomatic medicine. She has extensive clinical and research experience in the assessment of children and adolescents with mood disorders and suicidality, including the development of clinical programs to support children and families in healthcare settings. She has established a reputation as a national leader in the development of integrated mental health and medical care. 
and has research expertise in the area of mood disorders and medical conditions in children, adolescents, and adults, specifically HIV, sickle cell disease, as well as suicide. Um, her expertise also extends to health disparities and inequities in healthcare education. And um, she is the psychiatrist in chief and chair at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And I should add that there are very few women chairs and black women chairs. And so she is an incredible role model for doing, having all these firsts in these different ways. She's a holder of the Frederick Allen Endowed Professorship in Psychiatry, a member of the National Institutes of Mental Health, National Advisory Mental Health, Council. She's received uh, too many awards to list given our time constraint. I'll also add that um, just on a personal note, uh, Dr. Benton is a mentor and friend. She is always incredibly generous and has been really a Sherpa for me and so many um, women in academic medicine in terms of navigating some of the challenges. Um, and this has really been I think for generations of child psychiatrists, um, especially those with racially minoritized and marginalized identities, um, I'm grateful to have her on the speed dial. And I think I forgot to mention um, that she's also the ACAP, incoming president elect for ACAP. And we're so excited that um, she's going to be able to expand her mission, particularly around justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So without further ado, um, we're here to welcome Dr. Benton. Thank you. This is such an honor to be able to do this presentation um, in honor of Dr. Greenblatt, who, um, who lived so many of the principles that I value. And congratulations to you on this, this award and honor. And thank you, Erica, for that generous introduction. Um, I think I can almost do like this job that I do for all of these things without getting paid for it. So, um, you know, it's, I'm really glad that I can share with you some of the work that I've been involved in in the last few years. Um, I've been a child psychiatrist for a very long time. It's a very rewarding career, so you've made a good choice. And, um, but it has evolved over time. And I think it's really important to recognize that you can transform your career many times um, and do many different things. Um, and I think that the future of child psychiatry is really going to require us to step up and take on more leadership in child psychiatry in terms of addressing the issues that are coming up for young people in our country. So I wanna tell you a little bit about some work I've been doing um, recently that's been primarily focused on, oh, thank you, on, on suicide prevention. Um, and it's not where I thought I'd be in my career because the work is hard. Um, and so I wanted to do something that wasn't quite as hard, um, but recent events have really called for us to step in and um, look at what's happening to young people in America. So I don't have to tell you that um, the rates of suicide are not declining and for certain populations, they're increasing. And what I hope you take away from this um, discussion today is thinking about how you all can contribute to elevating our knowledge of what's happening with our young people. Um, doesn't mean you need to go out and write, a, write an application for a KR01, but I think just quality improvement um, looking at what's happening clinically will make a huge difference because what we're learning about minoritized youth who make suicide attempts or who die by suicide, we actually don't know much about those populations and the information is just starting to emerge. So I, I, I don't have any um, financial conflicts of interest. Um, as I mentioned today, I wanna to talk with you a little bit about the trends in suicide, um, what we're seeing among minoritized youth um, talk a little bit about some of our clinical experiences because to be candid with you, many of the things that we do focused on suicide prevention are not necessarily evidence-based. And it's only gonna become more confusing for us because the US Preventive Services Task Force just closed their solicitation of public comments on what they're going to release around screening for suicide. And, they're, and, and unless something changes, they're not recommending um, universal screening for suicide prevention in adolescents and, so, um, and in kids under 12. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that because that's, not, that's based on what's available. It's not based on what we know. And those are different things. So I'm showing you this busy diagram, not because I want you to remember what's on it, but I just wanna show you some of the trends we're observing about minoritized youth populations in the United States. And I want you to focus specifically on suicide attempts in the past year, um, C and D. 
injury by suicide attempts in the past year. What I want you to pay attention to is the, um, the orange, the dark orange line, which represents, um, which represents, wait a minute, the, okay, this is difficult to see. So the one line that looks kind of dark red orange, which represents Caucasian youth. And I want you to look at every other group. And what you'll observe is that the rates of suicide attempts in the past year, and this is data from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, um, the CDC survey that occurs every couple of years asking about behaviors that impose risk for adolescents every two years. If you look at C and D, what you'll notice is that for almost every group other than Caucasian youth, the rates are higher than they are. Um, they're higher for every other ethnic group. You'll notice the green line focuses specifically on multiracial youth. You'll notice we didn't even start collecting data on multiracial youth until 1999. And so the reality is that there was this conventional thinking. And if you look back at some of the older literature about suicide prevention, there's a, a classic article written by David Schaffer back in the day that really talked about the reason that rates of suicide attempts were lower for black youth is because black youth tended to externalize rather than internalize. And that has been the guidance for how we assess suicidality in youth for many, many years. Um, and this house, and still how many people assess suicidality in youth. And so I just wanted to highlight that what we're learning is that for all other ethnic groups, while suicide rates tend to be declining, they're not declining for everybody else. The rates are only declining for Caucasian youth. Now, Caucasian youth still are the largest number of suicide completers, but what we're starting to see, and we're gonna talk about that, is what's happening to rates of suicide, attempts and completed suicide among minoritized populations. And I think this diagram tells a story. This is the same data between 2009 and 2019, looking at youth suicide attempts by race and ethnicity. And then what you'll notice is that the higher percentages tend to be among Latino youth. Um, and they seem to be coming down a little bit. What you'll see for black youth, and part of the reason I don't think people notice is that it seemed to be inching up very slowly over time. And then you'll notice that for white non-Hispanic youth, the rates are not increasing all that much. But even with the declining rates for Latino youth, they're still higher than they are for other populations. This diagram, I, I just really want you to pay attention to um, the lower end of the diagram, um, starting at around 10 to 14 years of age. And the thing that I want to highlight here is what's happening among Native American youth. So interestingly, we expect to start to see the largest increases of suicidal behavior mid to late adolescence. So the numbers are higher for the later adolescents. We expect to see them going up for the group between 12 to 14 years of age. What we don't expect to see are increases in suicide risk for people under the age of 12. What you'll notice is for the Native American population, the rates start to increase fairly early. They start to increase at around 10 years of age, suggesting that the age trends that we see among minoritized youth are not the same across minoritized populations and are not necessarily consistent with the age trends that we're seeing in the broader, the broader population. Disparities by sexual orientation and identity. And I'll tell you, I thought this study was really interesting, which is why I want to share it with you today. So this was a, a, a study completed by Julie Rafeman and her colleagues. They were really interested in looking at suicide rates among um, LGBTQI youth compared with youth who identified as sexual majority youth. They also were interested in knowing whether the number of young people who identified as um, gender minority or sexual minorities had changed over time. So they looked at data between 2009 and 2017. This is not the um, CDC data looking at every state. This is the CDC data looking at, uh, at selected states because all of them didn't keep this level of information. And they were interested in learning how many kids identified as sexual minorities, how many had, had engaged in sexual relationships with other sexual minority youth and suicide risk. And what you'll observe is that the suicide rates or suicide rates of suicide attempts for kids who identify as sexual minorities are much higher than the blue line, those who identify as um, sexual majority youth. Um, what you'll notice is that 
between 2009 and 2017, you see a, you'll see a slight decrease between 2009 and 2011 and a peak, but the rates tend to be heading in the right direction. You'll notice in the lower curve, this actually looks at sexual minority youth who have sexual relationships with, with other sexual minority youth. And what you'll notice is the suicide rates don't seem to be declining as rapidly among that group. So there were some other interesting findings that came from this study. One is that between 2009 and 2017, the number of young people identifying as sexual minorities had doubled. And then between 2009 and 2017, there was about a 70% increase in the number of young people who identified as being sexual minorities who had sexual relationships with other sexual minority youth. The thinking by this group of investigators who were primarily adolescent medicine people were that as we opened up and became more accepting, there would be less distress associated with sexual minority status. But the data that we're seeing so far as it relates to suicide um, does not reflect that. And that was kind of one of the takeaway messages from this particular study. So what's been happening when we start to look at minoritized populations broadly? And there has been a lot of increased focus on black youth um, in part because of you know, some of the congressional action that we'll talk about a little bit later. But in general, what we're seeing when we look at suicide data over longer periods of time, this is between 1999 and 2018, that we're seeing significant percentage increases in suicide rates for all children. There's disparities in the numbers as you'll see here. And so for black children, there, there's been like an 87% increase between 1999 and 2018. If you look at Asian and Pacific Islanders, it's been a 140% increase. And among American Indian and Alaska Natives, it's been a 133% increase. When you look at the numbers broadly, the leading cause of death for Asian Americans, youth in our country between the ages of 15 to 24 is suicide. Um, it's the second leading cause of death for Latino and white youth. Um, and it's the third leading cause of death for black youth. But the news for black youth isn't good. Homicide is the number one leading cause of death. And if you look at the 15 to 24 age group, it's number one. If you look at every other age group, it's number two. So what's the data telling us broadly? It's telling us that our minoritized populations are at increased risk and our current practices of targeting groups based on what we think their risks are may not be appropriate. Um, we also know that the whole population data that we tend to use to make decisions or guide decisions about who's at risk may not be appropriate because the, the devil's in the details. And what we're gonna learn is when we look at Jeff Bridges studies, we learn some things about what, what, the studies, um, what the studies covered up in more ways than what the studies actually revealed. Um, we also know that for LGBTQI plus youth, um, the rates are higher. And for those who have intersectionality, the rates are even higher. Um, and then we also know that we're missing opportunities for prevention because most of us are aware that most youth make suicide attempts have actually killed somebody within two to four weeks before they actually die by suicide. So what are we learning about disparities in care and treatment? And I wanna talk a little bit about that because that's what's actually starting to become more apparent, particularly since COVID. So we learned a lot about health disparities during COVID, but we had actually started to learn about disparities in suicide prior to the COVID pandemic, which just actually made things worse. So when we looked back at the data collected by the CDC, when we took a second look, because all of this information was not apparent when the data was initially published, um, black students actually had the highest prevalence of attempts when we looked at trends between 1991 and 2017. Um, we also found that black adolescents had higher rates of attempts and that black male students had the lowest prevalence of suicidal ideation, but the highest numbers of attempts, which is concerning. And it's actually something that we need to take a deeper dive into because we're not sure why that is. Um, we also know that black adolescent boys tended to experience more severe injury after suicide attempts and that black adolescent girls experience an increased suicide attempts. While that was not true for other populations of girls and we're not really sure why that is. And we're just starting to take a look at what are some of the factors that might be contributing to those findings. The data has been pretty scarce but there's been an increased focus on how we understand suicide among minoritized populations.
So I want to start by talking a little bit about the 5 to 11 year olds, because that's really what has triggered a lot of public interest around suicide prevention in Black youth. And many of you may remember um, these studies. Um, this, looking at this data from 1990 to 2017, um, this would surprise you. So if we looked at the five to 11 year old age group, we would expect that we don't see much action on the suicide side among that group. Um, when we look at the 12 to 15 year olds, we would expect to start seeing increased rates. And then we would expect to see the highest rates in the older group, the 16 to 18 year old group. So like I looked at that data and I thought this makes sense to me. I have asked that many questions about it. And then Jeff Bridge and his team started to see some differences in their own community. So they were starting to see younger kids who died by suicide and just had a sense that this data was not necessarily telling the whole story about what was happening to black youth. And so they took a deeper dive and they started to break out that youth, that data for to 11 year olds. And what they discovered is there had been changes between 93 and 2012, but the way the data was trending was misleading. And so that if you look at this data for black boys between 1993 and 1997, black boys and white boys, white boys had a slightly higher rate of suicide, completed suicide compared with, with um, black boys had a slightly lower rate than white boys. You start to look at 98 to 2002, you start to see the trends change. Between 2003 and 2007, they changed pretty significantly. And that holds true through 2012. But the data was actually showing is changes in opposite directions that really kind of masked what was actually happening at the population level. And so people started to suspect that that had been happening for some time when we, we thought about suicide dating when we looked at it. And it turns out that's mostly true. Um, and so what they started to also notice is that the, this, the disparities in who was at risk decreased over time. So what we're saying when we see the older kids um, attempting suicide is more consistently true for at, at black and white adolescents. And so essentially the disparity appears to be among the younger age groups uh, and, and largest between the five to 11 year olds. So this article written by um, your very own Dr. Erica Bath, you know, people became interested in what was actually happening and what had been happening over time. So Dr. Bath and Jiragi actually went back and looked at all the data. And I'm sharing this beautiful table with you because it really tells the story. But I also think it also highlights the fact that what we're going to learn about how we take care of children um, with mental health conditions or kids that we care for is really going to derive from the work that we do in trying to understand the data that we have. And so in looking at this data, starting with 1980 to 1995, these changes and increases in Black youth suicide had been happening for some time. There had been an increase by 114% for Black youth. Um, Bridge confirmed that and showed an increase in Black children. Um, Price found an increase by 60%. And then every other study since that time has demonstrated consistent trends. So then why now, right? <laughs> this has been going on for a while. Why is this alarming to us now? Well, it's a, it became, this came to public attention, not because we brought it to public attention and not because medical professionals did. It was the US Congress, the, the, the US Black Caucus highlighted these issues around black youth suicide and published a document called Reading the Alarm. Now they pulled in a lot of mental health professionals to generate that document, but it's important that we step in and take some of this on. So Ariel Sheftow, who's also part of Jeff Bridges' group Columbus, has been doing some very interesting work in this area. And this is a recent study. Um, this is the most recent study and the large study happened to look at what's actually happening to Black youth. So and her team really interested in understanding one, what are the trends? And two, what are the precipitating circumstances? Because there's this thinking based on the literature that's out there that the reasons that Black youth attempt suicide are actually different than the larger population. And so they took two large databases, um, the Web-Based Inquiry Statistics Query Reporting System and the National Violence that to investigate suicide death rates over time for Black youth, but also what are the individual characteristics of youth who make those attempts? And then the goal was to understand those factors in order to inform prevention and address disparities. And what they found was very interesting. So they confirmed 
that suicide trends across age groups have been increasing over time. So the, the top diagram is focused on the five to 11 year olds. Lower diagram is um, the 12 to 14, and then the last one is five to 17. And so what they looked at was um, annual percentage change by year. And you'll notice that for, the, for A, for the five to 11 group, you see increasing suicide rates over time. Um, for the second group, the, um, the 12 to 14 year olds, you see increasing trends over time. And in the combined group, you see an annual percentage change of about 4%. Between the um, five to 11 group and the, and the um, 12 to the 15 to 17 group, you actually see a more significant increase among the, um, the five to 11 year old group in terms of percentage change of suicides you know, from year to year. And then when you look at this, you break this data out by gender, what you see is that for males who are the blue dots, um, you start to, you see a significant difference, almost twice, uh, the trend of almost twice as many completed suicides for girls as you see for boys. And so there seems to be a significant gender disparity for black girls and for black boys. And what else did we find about the whole sample? So that the majority of people in the sample were boys, 71%. Um, the majority of people who died in the study died by hanging, speculation, more common with black youth. Um, we talked about the difference, the increases yearly, greater for, greater for girls than for um, And essentially, most of the kids that were identified who, who died by suicide, not died with mental health conditions. It was only about 35%. Between girls and boys, it wasn't different. But there are some differences when we look at youth who died. We look at black populations compared to other populations. The other significant finding is that for most black youth who died by suicide, most of them died at home. They also looked at precipitating circumstances. And so there's some data, there's a lot of data that suggests for black youth who make suicide attempts, most of the time the conflicts are interpersonal. Um, and primarily family-based. That's true for younger, for younger kids. The five to 11 group, it's almost always some, some conflict within the family. For older kids, it's relationships, but that also tends to vary by gender. So for older adolescents, was relationship problems, um, legal problems, the presence of a mood disorder and uh, of disorders, depression for older adolescents is most commonly associated with suicide, different than younger kids. Um, Substance use was relatively low among Black youth who completed suicide. And so um, it was about 30%, but almost none of it was alcohol. It was primarily marijuana. And then for the 5, 11 to 12 to 14 group, it was family problems, school problems. Those kids are much less likely to leave a note explaining what they're doing. And the most common diagnosis was ADHD. And like now, I think that we're finding for the five to 11 year old group, that's true across ethnic groups. I mean, the impulsivity is the factor in the completed suicides, but among African-American youth, this is interesting because diagnosis of ADHD in African-American youth has been lower and treatment has been lower than it has been for Caucasian youth. For girls, there were different factors. So it was much more likely to have had a, a, a romantic relationship dispute, um, have a existing physical health problem like diabetes or asthma, um, more likely to have had a history of sigh or made attempts, have a current mental health diagnosis like depression or anxiety. And um, you know, as I mentioned before, boys were more likely to have legal problems or ADHD. So as I mentioned previously, the, um, the emergency Task Force on Black Youth Suicide and Mental Health was convened by the Congressional Black Caucus around the time that they started to hear more about increasing suicide rates for five to 11 year olds um, and more mental health concerns for Black youth. They pulled together, as I mentioned, stakeholders, consumers, people with lived experience, and scientists to generate a document laying out what risk factors were. The groups. And I think I'm not going to cover all of these in the interest of time today, because I, I noticed that you guys end on time. And so I'm going to try to support that. Okay, but what are the risk and protective factors that have been identified specifically for Black youth? And so the risk factors, as you can all see right away, are primarily social determinants of health. So they are the factors that impact all the other poor health outcomes that happen for minoritized populations in the United States. Neighborhood violence, 
economic insecurity, adverse childhood experiences, historical trauma, intergenerational trauma and racial trauma, which we rarely talk about because if you, you may remember that among the ACEs, racism didn't make the cut as an adverse childhood experience. And then trauma, which we know is disproportionately experienced in black communities when compared to any other community. So that's not minimize the suffering of any group. There's, lots, there's enough suffering to go around in America. There are lots of people suffering. But if you look at all of the literature about the downstream effects of racism and discrimination, it happens more to black Americans than it does to anyone else. And when black youth experience traumas, they're more likely to be greater in number and they're more likely to be severe. And some of these other ones are the ones we address every day, depression, externalizing behavior. That's important um, because as you'll see from some of the emergency department studies, externalizing behavior gets you no psychiatric assessment in the emergency department. It gets you discharged to outpatient follow-up, which we know most youth don't follow through on. Substance abuse, the presence of a mental health disorder. And then we also know that racism and discrimination are risk factors for poor mental health and suicidal behavior. And that is emerging data. So that's not a lot, there were not a lot of studies done on racism and discrimination as a factor impairing mental health and contributing to suicide into the last few years. And then of course, sexual and gender minority status and intersectionality makes it worse. So if you're a member of more than one minoritized group, your risk for suicide are higher. So I do wanna talk a little bit about some of the emerging studies on racism and discrimination. And so we're learning through studies focused specifically on the relationship between racism or racialized events and discrimination as a risk factor for poor psychological health and suicidal behavior. And there's a growing body of literature that supports those findings. We also know they're common. And so in studies looking at how often do black adolescents experience racial discrimination events, it's on average of about five per day. That includes um, microaggressions, other things that other people may not identify as racialized events. And then we're also learning that re-exposure to these events on television and online is also traumatizing. And so, you know, all the videos of black people with handcuffs behind their back being held down on the street by police officers is traumatizing. And then we also know that observing other people being discriminated against is also re-traumatizing. Um, this is all, this isn't just true for black populations, it's also populations um, and much more commonly associated with poor mental health outcomes um, for kids who have intersectionality and for Latino girls who are exposed to these events have higher rates of suicidality. So we're actually starting to look at these factors across groups um, and finding some commonalities about discrimination or perceived discrimination. And perceived discrimination is as damaging as what may be an actual act that others can observe. Um, sexual gender minority status increases your risk. And then I want to tell you a little bit about this study because there's been a lot of talk about the association between community violence and suicidal behavior. And, you know, and all the studies aren't necessarily all that strong. Um, and so the data isn't always that convincing. But I thought this study was interesting. So this was a study that occurred in Baltimore. This group looked at community violence exposure and suicidal ideation and attempts in 473 middle school youth. Um, and they also wanted to understand if depressive symptoms and aggressive behavior were associated as moderating variables um, for youth who develop suicidal ideation. Um, and so as I mentioned, the variables were community violence exposure, depressive symptoms, aggressive behavior, suicidal ideation, and attempts in sixth and eighth grade. So they started this study in sixth grade and they assessed these kids at seventh and eighth grade for the outcome of suicidality or aggressive behavior. What they found is that, and this is specifically for boys, that community violence exposure in the sixth grade was associated with depressive symptoms in the seventh grade, was also associated with aggressive behavior in the seventh grade, and that depressive symptoms and aggressive behavior were associated with suicidal ideation and aggressive behavior was associated with the suicide attempt. And so the authors concluded based on this study, and I actually think these authors are continuing this study, they identified that black boys exposed to community violence in sixth grade 
were more likely to make to have exhibit aggressive behavior, and that was associated with suicide attempts in eighth grade. What they discovered for girls was something different. And so community violence exposure was associated with depressive symptoms, suicidal ideation, and suicide attempt. Aggressive behavior was not. And so for girls who exhibited aggressive behavior, they didn't necessarily go on to make a suicide attempt. Now, when these investigators looked at these intervening variables, they discovered that the presence of depressants was the most consistent predictor of whether you would make a suicide attempt or not. And that community violence exposure was associated with aggression in Black boys, and that that was associated with suicide attempts. And some have suggested that for Black boys presenting in emergency departments, that there should be an assessment for suicidal behavior, even when they're pre presenting with aggressive behavior as a potential risk factor for a, a suicide attempt. And there was really no gender differences present for depressive symptoms. So the next question is, do these symptoms present in the same way? And are our instruments sensitive enough to identify depressive symptoms in Black youth. Now, we, we assume they are, so we use the same instruments for everyone, but there's some data that suggests that they're not, and that we really start to be looking at this more closely. So most of you are familiar with the CSP. I thought this study was interesting. Um, in this particular study, the investigators were interested in whether the CSD actually captured depression in Black boys. The rates have varied um, when you look at prevalence rates for depression among Black youth. Um, most of our assessments are based on the instruments we use for everybody else. Um, but in, in this particular study, they looked at the factors that capture depression. And so, as you know, the CESD has four factors, depressed affect, positive affect, somatic complaints, and interpersonal relations. And what these investigators discovered is that the four-factor model actually did not capture depression for Black youth. That Black youth were much more likely to identify somatic complaints and interpersonal relationships and depressed affect as one variable. So they actually suggested that there should be a two-factor model when using the CESD in Black youth. Now, I don't know if these authors want to move forward with the CESD. I think the take-home message is that we really need to study these instruments in broader populations, because if you look at a lot of the studies, they don't tell you who the populations were. They don't necessarily tell you what the minority representation were in studies. That's changing. But um, we can't assume that the instruments that we use for everybody else work, works for all kids. Um, we know about ACEs um, for the sophisticated audience. I'm not going to talk much about that, except the major take home message is that minoritized populations are overrepresented among Medicaid in poor communities, much more likely to be exposed to community violence and all the other downstream effects of, of those impoverished communities. So in mental health, <laughs> I would advocate for us spending more time thinking about protective factors and health promotion. And you know, I think we've all realized that we're never gonna have enough child psychiatrists or psychologists or social workers or anybody else to address all the mental health challenges that we're facing. It makes sense for us to find what the natural resilience and supportive factors are in population to focus more on health promotion so that we can do the work that we really need to do. But what we've learned for Black youth's protective is strong supportive relationships, which is true for all youth, full of ethnic identity. I'll talk a little bit more about that because that's an important tool to use when working with minoritized populations. Religious and spiritual engagement as, as a support School connectedness is a major support and a major source of intervention to promote health in young people um, is our education space in schools. And then personal factors, strong academic performance is really important because so much of that derives from support within your school and feeling connected to your educational environment. And then of course, financial factors. So stable financial factors matter, but having money doesn't matter, okay? It, it doesn't determine whether your well being is better or not. So I want to talk a little bit about ethnic and racial identification and, and what does that actually mean? So when we, we talk about um, ethnic and racial identity, what we're really talking about is a psychological construct that helps people think about who they are and where they fit. And it's a process of socialization over time um, that really influences their beliefs about themselves, um, activities they undertake, and create a sense of, of self-esteem over time. 
ethnic racial identity has been identified as a protective factor for Black youth. And so racial trauma, I mentioned that a little bit earlier. We rarely talk about racial trauma. And so for Black Americans, uh, among others, for Black individuals, when we talk about racial trauma, it is a, it's a form that specifically refers to BIPOC people in our country. Reactions to dangerous or perceived dangerous experiences of racial discrimination, which are prevalent and common. Some of these are the actual physical harm or threat. Some of it is shaming, humiliation, or witnessing other people having negative experiences who look like you. And it's similar to post-traumatic stress, but it's not the same. And it's not the same because it's, it's ongoing, it's daily, it's not evident, evident to the people around you, and it's, it's painful and damaging because it's collective injury over time. And unfortunately, um, unfortunately in mental health, we haven't gotten comfortable talking to people about their race-based trauma. Um, I did just wanna talk briefly about a couple of examples of some of the interventions that have been helpful because more and more investigators are starting to focus on what kinds of things can we actually do to help. So it's important to recognize what people are experiencing. It's also important to think about how we can use the natural strengths that exist within people to support their resilience. One of the interventions I like was developed by Howard Stevens and his team. It's called RECAST, Racial Encounter, Coping, Appraisal, and Socialization Theory. And what I really like about it is racial socialization is really how you think about and make meaning of your own race. And the goal of, of focusing on that is it the, it's an attempt to in, improve your self-efficacy. So it, you know, accepting who you are and understanding what that means is a way to make you more effective in dealing with race-based situations. And so, for example, you know, um, what happens when the police pulls you over? What do I teach my 16-year-old son? When the police pulls you over, you put your hands on the dashboard, you don't talk back, you do all these things to keep yourself safe. But in order to do that, you have to be in control of yourself. So if you panic and freak out and get scared and drive off, the chances of that happening to you are much greater. What Recast teaches you is how to manage yourself in race-based situations. So it's, it helps you develop appraisal and coping skills. Thinking about your situation, monitoring your physical reactions, um, and being able to work through a situation so you can walk away from it to make sense at another time. So some of the elements of recast is pride messaging, okay, teaching families to tell their kids about the things that are good about their ethnic identity, Preparation for bias recognition, like I just described with my child, right? So letting him know the situations that can be dangerous and what can he do about it? How can he prepare? Promotion of distrust, which can be good or bad if it goes too far. And egalitarianism, helping your child understand that you're all the same regardless of your race. The goal of this is to help black families navigate the complexities of race in the country. And it considers the role of racial socialization, but it also provides you with cognitive behavioral strategies for coping with the stresses of racism. And I actually think it's a really great intervention for building pride and self-esteem. We haven't looked at recast as it relates to suicidality or mood disorders, but I, we're starting to see emerging research by lots of different investigators looking at ways to manage ourselves and solicit support. So there's a, a, a large movement towards um, what they're calling um, emancipation circles, um, for, where people get together and share experiences about discrimination and how they, they, they cope with it and finding support for each other. There's also a big focus on mindfulness as a way to manage racially charged situations and to manage your physical reactions to them. So what we're starting to see is a lot more work in this area. The reason I think it's important, you know, this most of the interventions that we will do provide, it really impact large communities. So it's being in schools, it's been in the community, but as providers, clinicians who are working with patients, it's important to have something to do other than just talk about how bad we feel about the fact that things are bad. And so I think these are, these are interventions worth exploring. Racial identity has been studied as a protective factor um, for black youth. Um, and this was an interesting study where they looked at online racial discrimination and bullying um, in two groups of kids. Um, and they used a scale that measures um, ethnic identification. 
And they looked at kids who were exposed to online bullying, those who had a strong ethnic identity, those who did not. And what they discovered, if you look at, the, this, look at this study, the low ethnic identity group tended to have higher rates of anxiety. So these were kids who had been assessed for anxiety as the online discrimination continued. For the kids who actually had strong racial identification, their levels of anxiety were not affected by online bullying. And I think as, as it relates to anxiety, we know that um, on that racialized, strong racial identification can be protected. So what's actually happening in our clinical settings? I wanna talk about what's happening in our emergency departments where a lot of uh, minoritized youth receive their care. So this study I thought was very reflective of what happens in most busy US emergency departments. So this study, this study was from a large database on um, the National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Survey. Um, looking at what was happening in emergency departments between 2011 and 2015. And, you know, what they saw overall were large increases in psychiatric emergency department visits. Now, we all know that even before the pandemic, we were seeing large increases in these populations. What they found is that the largest number of, of new patients coming to the emergency department were Black and Latino youth um, seeking emergency care. What they also discovered is that for black and Latino youth who were coming to the emergency departments, they were there for a very long time. So, you know, they were there for more than three hours most of the time. But even after three hours in the ED, most of them did not receive a mental health assessment. And for black youth who were coming to the emergency department, they were more likely to be publicly insured and more likely to be discharged as having some kind of behavior disorder and not a disorder that would place them at risk for, for completed suicide. And I have to say that this is not an uncommon experience. This is what we're seeing in our emergency departments. Um, another study, and I think this is a really good study, this really focused on what happens to youth after acute psychiatric treatment. So Fontanelle and colleagues looked at 140,000 youth with Medicaid um, who were between 10 to 18 who had been psychiatrically hospitalized. And in this study, they were looking at follow-up visits. So, you know, so one who had follow-up visits within a week of discharge. And then, of, of, and then what was different about the kids who had the follow-up visits versus the ones who didn't. Um, and so what they discovered is that six months, if you had a follow-up visit within one week of discharge, your risk for another suicide decreased by 50%. There's almost nothing we do in mental health or actually in, in that decreases your risk by 50%. But what they learned is only a little over 50% of youth in the study actually attended a follow-up mental health appointment within seven days of discharge. And when they tracked who those people were who did not attend the visits, it was people receiving Medicaid because they were low income versus having a chronic condition. Um, they were individuals with history of a chronic condition or substance use. Um, and they were more likely to be black youth who did not have a follow-up visit and suggesting that the risk for suicide for black youth is, is probably related to what happens once they leave medical settings. Um, I wanna talk about this study briefly because I actually think this is a really good study and almost nobody talks about it. So this is a study from ED Stars. It, in this particular study, they were interested in looking at risk profiles for children seen in emergency departments. So the ED Stars um, project, as you probably know, is a multi-site studies looking at kids who come into the emergency department complaining of suicidality. So Cheryl King and her group have been running these studies for years. In this particular one, they were interested in um, profiles of youth um, who were presenting with suicidality, trying to determine who were um, high risk profiles versus lower risk profiles. So they looked at aggression, suicidal thoughts and behaviors and developed five profiles based on that. What they found from this study, just briefly, is that there were specific profiles that seemed to be specific to black youth. And those profiles frequently focused more on aggressive behaviors and not necessarily suicidality, even though these kids had endorsed suicidality when coming into the emergency department. And what they found is that for youth presenting with a profile where aggression was variable, that they were much less likely to be evaluated for suicide um, and much more likely to be discharged from the hospital um, despite the fact that they had a history of suicidality, once again, kind of reinforcing what happens in the emergency department setting. And then bias and diagnosis, it's prevalent, it's common, there's a ton of literature, we'll need to go over that today, <laughs> in the interest of time. 
So what do we know about interventions? This will be the shortest part of the talk. <laughs> so there's actually not a lot out there and there hasn't been a lot of studies. Just broadly, there's almost no studies focused on African-American youth and no studies that have demonstrated suicide risk reduction for black youth. There's no studies focused on culturally relevant interventions for suicide prevention for black youth. Um, there were two studies that mentioned that the, that, you know, the intervention could have some benefit for black youth. One of those was attachment-based family therapy. Um, and then there were four studies that suggested some benefit from some interventions. Um, and there's only been one study that actually demonstrated some benefit for suicide risk reduction for black youth. And that was um, an MST study that happened to have a large black sample because of where it occurred. It was a convenient sample in, in Mrs. Mississippi or Missouri, Mississippi. I'm sorry, I don't want to offend anybody from Missouri. Um, I think it was in Mississippi. And they actually used MST um, on a, a group of young people discharged from um, inpatient uh, psychiatric service. And what they learned is that, um, you know, that group of kids who were part of the MST intervention, as opposed to routine discharge from a psychiatric hospital and follow up care, actually reduced their suicide attempts over a 16 month period of time. And that they also identified greater parental control in that time period. But eventually after 16 months, you know, most went back to baseline. And that's been one of the strongest studies to date. Um, you know that all the kids who need services don't get them. And a lot of the things that we do clinically are anecdotal. So they're not things that we know because studies have supported it. We do know some things um, based on the data that's out there. And that is that minoritized youth are often less engaged in traditional treatment. Um, they're much less likely to continue treatment after discharge from um, an emergency department. We try to take a proactive approach to engagement, but much of what we're doing is based on very limited data. So, you know, some of the things that we've been trying, um, you know, my team is actually studying a culturally competent care navigation system right now as part of R34 for um, a suicide center. But, you know, some motivational interviewing principles um, for Black youth who are coming to the emergency department to engage them in treatment. Um, culturally concordant care navigators, we're piloting that. The data has been inconsistent. Um, some studies suggest that having ethnic matching of providers and patients has fit. Some say that it doesn't really matter very much. Um, and so we're actually starting to look at some things that we hope could make some difference. So what are we doing? Um, and like, like I said, in the interest of time, because I realize we've got about two minutes, um, I just want to highlight what we're doing for all youth. And we're recommending screening for everyone. And even though, like I said, it's going to be tricky if the Preventive Services Task Force does stick with the line that they've taken in their draft statements, that they're not recommending universal screening, I think it's going to be confusing to people. But I do think because we don't know, we have to ask. And what we're learning a lot about, you know, some of the data suggests for Black families that for kids with ADHD, kids who are externalizing, they frequently don't know they're feeling suicidal unless someone asks them. And so there's some benefits in asking everyone. And then, of course, when you, you have a positive, um, you know, you do a risk assessment and a formulation. And then collaborative safety planning. And I don't mean other safety planning, I mean Stanley Brown safety planning, the one that has elements of DBT, CBT, and crisis intervention works. Safety planning is not an evidence-based intervention for adolescents. And we're stud several centers are studying that now. Barbara Stanley's group, um, Jeff Bridges' group, and other people are looking at safety planning in adolescents, but right now it's the best we have. And what I would say is that screening, safety planning, Given the circumstances right now that we're in, it's important to do them, even though we don't have the evidence base to support them completely. And then all the things you do when someone's suicidal, you maintain contact between visits, they don't show up, you follow up. And then it's also really important to be thoughtful about developing suicide safety plans and treatment. And so CBT in general is not okay for suicidal youth. CBT SP is okay for suicidal youth. But your, your interventions really need to be targeted specifically for suicide. And like I said, you know, we find that having um, diverse providers increases the consistency of follow-up for our patients, but the data doesn't necessarily support that. Um, the other thing um, I'd like to talk about before we, before we wrap up is I actually would like to just emphasize for all of you, 
that it's going to be really important that we focus on research to help us understand these questions. Um, research that focus on risk and protective factors um, and interventions that are specific to minoritized populations. And I want to highlight they're not the same. And so the reason I'm not giving a talk about multicultural youth is the factors that drive suicide in specific populations are not the same. And it's important that we approach our understanding of those circumstances from that perspective. We also need to collaborate with those communities when we're doing research. So even if you're not doing community participatory research, if you're doing things like screening and that those kinds of interventions, it's, it's really important that you partner with the community for their participation and their feedback. Um, we need to diversify the clinical and research workforce. Um, and we need to build pipelines to support that. And then racism needs to be conceptualized as a driver in research, not as a side effect, or we just need to make sure we have enough this color people in the research um, to be inclusive. It's important that we look at racism as a variable. And then the other evidence supported ways to engage people in treatment are things that we should do. And it's 1101, so I'm gonna stop my comments now. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Benton, for bringing this um, issue, this pressing issue to the forefront and, and highlighting both uh, so much that we don't know yet, but also um, a, a path forward, um, both clinically and in research. Um, we have uh, one question from the, the audience. You know, what sparked, uh, among many questions that I had based on what you were presenting is, is even uh, when you pointed out how depression screeners don't necessarily perform in the way that we, we think they should in uh, different minoritized populations, it, it uh, made me wonder, do, do we even know uh, that our interventions are that effective for youth depression? based on that and you know it leads me to think maybe we we, we need to be um, trying to replicate what we think works yeah. um, you know in, in a, a much more uh, expanded way yeah so, so I mean so we we actually don't know that the interventions that we use work as well I mean there's 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 been a lot of focus right now on looking at culturally um, culturally acceptable interventions, because unfortunately what happens is they, people disengage from treatment. So many times, you know, um, black families um, have a long history of not engaging in treatment and not following up with traditional mental health settings. And so there's a lot of research focused right now on using schools and using faith-based communities as ways to connect with folks um, as a way to engage people in treatment. But now we, we don't really know whether the interventions that we're using with everyone actually works for a lot of kids. And you know, we also have to think that in many cultures, they're much more group-based and family-based. It's not, they're not individually oriented. They're much more community oriented. And we need to think about um, adapting our interventions you know, to think about that. Now, mind you, that being said, we, ha we have to do what we know how to do right now because we actually are in a bit of a crisis. And so we have to use the tools that are available to you know, identify as many people as we can. So thanks for the question. Well, thank you so much for joining us and uh, congratulations to you and, and congratulations to Dr. Espana for your award. Bye-bye.